Welcome to our Science Cafe. We're very excited to have you all join us. Um, so we are super excited to have one of our own uh, faculty members with us this evening, Dr. Ian Drummond. And as many of, of you know, um, kidney disease is one of our most pressing health issues in this country and in the world. About 37 million people suffer from this disease. It affects about 14% of our population. Um, and the MDI Biological Laboratory has a long history of uh, studying kidney disease. And in fact, dating back about 100 years ago, when some of the first physician scientists came here to Salisbury Cove um, to study this disorder. And they, at the time, were very interested in simply understanding how the kidney works. They, um, at that point, didn't even clearly understand exactly uh, how things worked in, within the organ itself. That led to the development of dialysis, to the development of the um, kidney function test. And so many of those things we continue to use today. So again, long, long history of that type of research happening here at MDIBL. Today, our research around kidney disease focused largely on regeneration. So understanding whether or not it may be possible to enhance our regenerative capacity or our ability to repair damage in the kidneys. But we're also looking at whether it's possible to grow kidneys in a dish, to actually develop artificial kidneys, if you will, using a patient's own stem cells. And that is what Dr. Um, Drummond is largely heading up here at MDIBL. He's part of a nationally funded program to do exactly that called Rebuilding the Kidney. And so with that, I'm gonna introduce Ian and have him tell you more about his work. So Ian, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, let's see if I can share my screen and get going here. Thank you all for coming. It's, a, it's fun to talk about this, for me anyway, and I hope it is fun for you too. It's an exciting time in regenerative medicine, as many of you know, with the last 15 years or so since the discovery of the ability to make stem cells out of virtually any cell. Um, it's really pushed us to ask new questions about whether we can use stem cell technology and regenerative medicine to address some really intractable problems as, as Jerry laid out, um, issues of kidney failure, uh, getting people off dialysis. So prior to the last 15 years of sort of revolutions in stem cell biology, uh, developmental biology led the way in showing us how the kidneys form. And prior to that, as Jerry mentioned, uh, it was really the study of renal physiology and kidney function that um, defined what we need to do right now to make a new kidney. So we're really standing on the shoulders of all these giants who've gone before. And um, the hope is we can really take advantage of all this strong foundation in, in kidney biology uh, and apply it to building new tissue. And so that's our challenge in, in this little kind of informal uh, half hour, I'm gonna give you a brief history of the kidney why, why we want it, uh, how it works, uh, the current health problem with the kidney, and what we think could be regenerative solutions. Now, I'm going to give it in broad outline, so if you um, tire of that and want more details, be sure to interrupt with a question, and I think Emily will relay them to me. Uh, let's see here, boom. So, uh, one of our heroes here is Homer Smith. Homer was one of the original, or perhaps the original kidney physiologist uh, working at MDIBL who showed that the kidney filters the blood and purifies the blood. And surprises me that prior to his work, people really had mystical ideas about how organs worked. And it was his innovation in developing tools to show that the kidney filtered the blood, uh, that it was a voluminous amount of filtration, a somewhat of a surprise to learn how much blood was filtered, and that uh, the good things were pulled back out of, uh, of the filtered blood. Uh, so it's very much an editing process that the kidney undergoes to function. So he said, uh, superficially, it might be said that the function of the kidneys is to make urine, but in a more considered view, one can say that the kidneys make the stuff of philosophy itself. So that's a slightly mystical comment. Uh, my take on the first part of it is that to say that the kidney's function is to make urine is like saying 
the function of your air conditioner is to heat up the air outside your house. So the kidneys really are involved in maintaining this exquisite balance of salt and water that lets everything else function, our hearts, our brains, and everything. And, it, and more than that, it really allowed humankind to evolve from simple creatures. And I think that's what Homer is referring to here, that the, he studied comparative biology and uh, the structure of organs in different creatures to, to learn about how uh, the kidney allowed adaptation and survival of creatures in all kinds of environments. Uh, so, for instance, we know that life evolved in the oceans and a salty environment, our original cells were adapted to physiology in such an environment. And as, the, as creatures became more complex and partitioned, our internal fluids remain pretty much the same. And even to a point where fish were walking out of the oceans onto dry land, amphibians evolved. Um, it was the kidney that preserved the original salty milieu or surroundings for our cells that allows them to function in these bizarre environments, including deserts. Um, so uh, Homer really took advantage of this idea that um, by studying all different sorts of creatures, we could learn a lot about adaptation and organ function. And he wrote this really beautiful little book uh, in the 60s, From Fish to Philosopher, where he laid out just a, exactly how he saw um, sort of evolution of form and function throughout the animal kingdom, where each one of these creatures is adapted to live in a certain environment and their kidneys are adapted to let them survive there. Uh, so he, beyond being a, a brilliant physiologist and uh, evolutionary biologist, he was a real philosopher too. And um, it's a really, it's still a good read. Um, I just highlight here a little digression that the cost of enlightenment in the 1960s was only a dollar and 45 cents. So, you know, it was a good decade. Um, one of my favorite chapters from this book is Homer describing how he, uh, he studied these lungfish that live in Africa and during a dry season will estivate and surround themselves in this mucousy ball and turn into these kind of rotting carcasses until they reemerge when the rains come again. But he describes how he had to basically smuggle them through LaGuardia Airport when he came back to uh, um, NYU or in New York. Um, and I just love that image of him trying to get these things, these stinking carcasses through, uh, you know, Homeland Security, but maybe it was easier then. Um, so today, uh, MDIBL is still famous for uh, its uh, origins of renal physiology courses coming up in August. And uh, people still come here. I'd say it's a rite of passage for renal fellows who want to do research. Um, this is one of my fellows who took the course here and at the kidney shed where Homer did some of his seminal work. So what Homer discovered was that the kidney filters the blood and that good stuff is recovered. So in this input in red, uh, you have the unfiltered blood and the blood, it passes through a very high uh, a discriminating filter to keep all the cells and big proteins in the blood and let all the little stuff through. And these tubes, these sort of undulating shapes, uh, are uh, hollow tubes where the fluid is passed finally out into urine. So uh, we can accept now, based on his studies and others, that um, about 180 liters of blood is filtered every day by our kidneys. And that would fit, that's about enough blood that would fill this shopping cart if it were solid. So that's the volume of blood your, your, your kidney filters every day. And in the uh, four or five minutes you've been listening to me, uh, your kidney has filtered about enough uh, blood, 500 mils, 600 mils that would fill this bottle. Um, so all that filtration seems kind of inefficient. Uh, why do all that? And uh, recover the solute. Well, it's one of the best ways to selectively reconstitute blood, essentially filter all of it and take back what you want. And that taking back is the function of these renal tubular cells through specific 
they have specific appetites for different ions, sugars, amino acids, and the transport processes are, are incredibly complex, uh, but very efficient and allow us to keep what we want in our own fluid and basically let everything else go by, which reminds me mostly of like a sushi bar. Uh, with the floating boats, you know, is that a little glucose? I'll have some of that. And uh, let's see, some amino acids. Okay. Oh, oh, uremic toxins. No, thank you. I think I'll pass on that. And, you know, so that's how your kidney works. I can't tell if you're laughing or really rolling your eyes at my jokes, but I'll just keep going anyway. So what's the problem? Um, a lot of people have kidney disease. And why is that? That's our problem. Uh, so hundreds of millions of people uh, have kidney disease around the world. And the problem is actually increasing with new forms of kidney disease. Uh, we have a visiting scientist, Nishad Jaya Sundara, will be joining us to study um, a kidney disease of equatorial agri agricultural communities of unknown origin, but uh, chronic kidney disease is affecting children now. Um, we really haven't made too much progress um, there have been some breakthroughs recently in, in drugs that can forestall the development of chronic kidney disease. But in terms of curing people who already have damaged kidneys, really the only thing is dialysis and transplant. Um, and so learning new alternatives to that would be a good thing. Uh, the sad fact is that 13 or so people die every day waiting for a kidney transplant. And this was from eight years ago, nine years ago. Uh, showing this disparity of, of the people waiting for organ transplants and the actual number of transplants performed. Uh, so the urgency is there for us to take advantage of whatever we can to, to give patients hope for a better life um, and get kidney function back. So you can imagine with this complex cell structure that um, it's a pretty complex challenge. Uh, you need a, a, a blood filter, you need uh, different blood vessels. You need all sorts of different tubule cells, supporting cells. Um, there's at least 30 cell types in the kidney. Um, so how are we going to do that? You know, how are we going to reconstruct this thing so that it works? So that was the challenge that the NIDDK, National Institutes of uh, Health, brought forward about six years ago. And um, there's a competitive uh, grant opportunity to really try and figure out how to make kidney cells and how to show that you've made the right kidney cells and how do you incorporate them into useful structures and, and show they're actually functional. And then how can you finally uh, make a structure or matrix or scaffold that can be implanted in a, in a patient that would ultimately replace missing renal function? And uh, another overarching goal of the consortium is to figure out how to prevent damage in the first place. So um, with those things in mind, uh, we got involved. Um, and I'll tell you a bit about what we've done. Uh, but in general, there have been a number of approaches brought forward. One of the, the one we've uh, hitched our carriage to is this idea you could take uh, stem cells, um, really take cells from any part of your body and turn them into stem cells and then drive them into a kidney um, cell type or kidney structures uh, in, in cell culture, and then use these uh, progenitors to make uh, nephron structures and then try and implant them. Um, so Leif Oxbury is a colleague of mine in the consortium and he has done this and implanted uh, kidney uh, organoids, small little organs made in a dish, and showing they can survive under the surface of, a, of an adult kidney uh, they can recruit blood vessels from the, the host tissue. Uh, the problem is they don't seem to really functionally graph. The output is missing. Other people have tried to take a uh, engineering approach, which is using 3D printing and, and creating uh, channels and ducts in tissue, or rather in, in matrices, some synthetic scaffolds and then uh, seed them with cells and trying to make so synthetic uh, kidney tubules. And in this example, they're printing two 
uh, tubules side by side in what they call fugitive inks. And once you remove those inks, you print the inks and then uh, submerge them in a structure or a matrix and then remove the fugitive red and green inks and you end up with these hollow channels into which you can seed cells. So this is the work of Jennifer Lewis's lab as part of the consortium. And she's been successful in generating uh, polarized epithelial tubes uh, in printed structures. Uh, and I'd say now it's at the proof of principle stage where the questions being asked are, can we get transport between two adjacent tubes? Uh, is it vector, is it directional? Can we get selective recovery of glucose or amino acids from one tube to another? And I think she's showing that you can, as long as you get the right cell types in the right place. And then future issues are clearly scale and complexity, but at least the proof of principles there that you can 3D print tubules. Uh, others are taking a, a more back to the kidney approach of just taking a, an adult organ and taking the cells out and looking to see whether the remaining matrix or support tissue is adequate to uh, seed cells in to make a kidney tissue. And here, I think the, the lessons learned are that different types or different regions of the kidney have different types of supporting uh, matrix. And that can be, um, have a very dominant effect on what kinds of cells will survive there or attach there. Um, so it's been informative. But overall, the goals I think are to take uh, pluripotent cells, these IPS uh, embryonic stem cells, drive them into a, a kidney progenitor state, and then let them differentiate into organoids or small structures in a dish that resemble nephrons that have, they're made, they're tubules and uh, they have the filter on one end, um, and then find a way to, to build them out and scale them into a scaffolded tissue assembly that could be engrafted. And um, that's pretty much where we're at right now is we, we've got to the point of, making kidney nephron progenitors, making organoids, we can put them into scaffolded assemblies. Now we have to show that they can be engrafted, can function. So you can imagine the issues of trying to show the function of a very small addition to the kidney in the place, in the, in the context of a big functioning kidney. Um, maybe there's other ways to think of it and I'm open to suggestions, but that's, that's where we are. So my labs, um, approach has been shaped by kidney development. I've been asking, what do we know about kidney development and what do we know about how it normally takes place? And can we exploit this idea that these, these <clears throat> progenitor cells can self-assemble essentially uh, under local signaling or local communication between cells, they can make complex tissues on their own. So this details how, um, kidney stem cells in red here form new nephron structures that attach um, to a budding epithelium and form a filtering nephron, a tube and a filter at the end of it in uh, sort of growing out uh, as the kidney gets bigger during embryonic development. And so that's shown here with this beautiful movie made by Frank Costantini of the epithelium, as it grows into a mass of, of tissue and forms this tree-like architecture of the collecting system and the kidney. And at each tip of this branch or at each tip of this tree, uh, a new nephron will form. And that, um, see if I can make this happen, sort of in uh, stop motion animation would be something that looks like this. As the branching occurs, uh, kidney stem cells condense into little clusters and then uh, form these um, elaborate nephron structures that hook up or attach to the growing tree of epithelium. Um, so uh, looking at this uh, from an anatomical point of view, the, the, the tubes you saw branching in green would be these purple things here. And it's these cells, right, this layer of cells depicted in green that are really of great interest because they're the ones that are the stem cells that will form these balls of condensed tissue and ultimately these uh, convoluted tubules and blood filters. 
Um, so <clears throat> it's fascinating to know how you know mice and humans can make nephrons. The, the only problem is we're done at birth. We're born with a million nephrons. And that's what we got pretty much for the rest of our lives. And we have to preserve their function. And you can imagine that anything like uh, drug injuries, uh, loss of blood flow, anoxia kind of injuries, uh, over time, you start knocking off nephrons. And that if you knock off too many, you get into um, chronic kidney disease and ultimately end stage renal disease, which is essentially kidney failure. So you don't want to get to that point. And if you are, you want a solution. And unfortunately, we can't make new nephrons. Um, however, the fish can. So the fish does. As the fish grow, I think most all fish probably although only a few have been studied, they keep making new kidney tissue. And you can measure that by looking at how many filters are there. Um, and uh, these fish you're looking at here are called zebrafish. They're now a well-known and robust genetic system for looking at vertebrate um, development and disease. We've been studying them for the past 25 years, um, studying how the, the genes it function in Zebrafish are actually the same ones that are commonly mutated in human disease. So it's a way, it's a platform for discovery of gene function in kidney development and kidney function. And, and now we're taking advantage of the fact that it makes new nephrons as an adult to see what, what's really different about them or the same, or where's this divergent? How come we can't make new nephrons and they can? And so that's our central driving question really. And so if you look at it you know, anatomically, what you observe in fish is that there are these little clusters here depicted in red, uh, real dense little cells, really high, a lot of nucleus, not that much cytoplasm. And that as if you injure or stimulate the fish to grow, you'll see them turn into these sort of convoluted tubule shapes um, that ultimately uh, plumb in uh, to the uh, existing tubular architecture and contribute a new filter. And it's very dramatic if you injure, a, if you take an adult kidney that's really pretty much stopped growing, so there's not too many new nephrons being made, and you injure it with a, a nephrotoxin, we use gentamicin, um, boom, within seven days, you get hundreds of new nephrons forming. And, and I think that's what's here. Yeah, so this is a, an adult kidney with not a lot of growth going on. And this is uh, all these are new nephrons visualized by um, gene expression for specific genes that are only on during early kidney formation. Uh, so from this, we know the fish have a robust regenerative response. And that if you look closer, if you zoom in on one of these uh, blue blobs here, you'll find it's made of a whole lot of cells that are undergoing a lot of proliferation. They're adjacent to the existing tubes. And that over time, they, have, they invade and then form a new a luminal connection with the existing tubule. Um, so this uh, presents the opportunity to understand what are the signals that drive um, this process? What are, what are the cells? Where do these cells come from? Um, and how do they do this plumbing trick? Um, so that's what we're studying with the overall goal of um, relating it back to this process of normal development in humans and relating it back to the idea that we might be able to engraft stem cell derived organoids into a, an adult organ. A tall order perhaps, but I think what we're learning is that many of the same genes and growth factors and the whole process is actually the same between an adult fish that's been injured and an embryonic mouse or human that is just growing. The cells that we're finding in the adult fish that are responsible for the regenerative response express all the same genes. So this is uh, 6 2 eyes absent and OSR1. They're all just names of genes, but they're critical genes, uh, transcriptional regulators that are essential for kidney formation in mammals. And they're all expressed in these uh, adult fish cells, which I think I'll show you. There they are. So this is a tubule, and this is a single cell adjacent to the tubule. 
And this 6-2 is a gene that's really only expressed in kidney stem cells, in the kidney anyway, it's only in the stem cells. And so we can show by staining with an antibody that it's expressed in these single cells. And this other staining, this green fluorescence is um, a marker that we've taken advantage of for years. It's a transgenic fish that expresses a jellyfish green fluorescent protein in the stem cells. And so that's a sort of our gold standard marker because we know if we transplant, if we take some of these green cells out and put them in a new kidney, they'll make new nephrons. So that's just how we're sort of bootstrapping our way to understanding uh, what the biology of these stem, stem cells is and can we show they contribute to new nephrons. And here's another way of looking at them. There are these single blue cells adjacent to an existing tube. Um, both of these genes are kidney stem cell markers. And so they're, they're just sitting there in the adult fish, uh, quiescent or waiting for a signal to wake up and make a new nephron. Um, so this is a, a, a valuable model, I think, for you know, how to think about what you could do. Could we get similar cells into a human? Um, how would you stimulate them? Um, what conditions would you need for them to aggregate or come together a little ball? And uh, what conditions would you need to have them invade and, and actually make a function, functional connecting tube? Uh, so much of our work has uh, been funded to address this problem of engraftment and how tubules interconnect, because we know we can make organoids in a dish. We just can't get them to connect that well. And so the fish do it all the time. So we're studying how they do it. Um, and in brief, um, this is an example of one of those new nephrons. And you can see at the very base, there are all these finger-like projections that seem to be digging their way into another tube. And if you make a 3D model and spin it around, you'll see the bottom of this new nephron is just loaded with these sort of invasive fingers. So these we know from other work we're doing are, are called invadopodia. They have structures on them that are as associated with uh, degradation of tissue around them, uh, extension of sharp little fingers, and an invasion of other tissues. And if that sounds familiar, well, there's one of them sort of looking at you and then turn sideways. It has all these invasive processes at their base as they um, invade the existing tubule structure. So that process is essential to create a fluid output. And it's also the same thing that happens in this process of mammalian development that I've been talking to you about, that during this uh, formation of a, a nephron at the tip of the branching epithelia, you can observe the, the, um, that part of the new nephron sticking into the lumen of the collecting system and, and forming a new um, connection there. It kind of looks like they're throwing up some cells too, which we really don't know why they do that, but it may be part of this ex sort of explosive connection process driven maybe by pressure within the, the, the nephron itself. We don't know, it'd be interesting to find out. Um, another area where uh, invasion is certainly an issue, is tumor metastasis. Um, tumors can become migratory and invasive, um, and this is a problem. Uh, so you want to prevent that in the case of tumors, but we turned it to our advantage by looking at what genes are expressed in metastatic tumors and asking, are there any of these a clue to how a fish might um, perform the same event only under normal circumstances. And we find there are at least 20 or 30 genes that are similarly expressed in our little clumps of, in, of new nephrons, these green cells on a tube and uh, human metastasis. So perhaps surprisingly or not surprisingly, uh, many processes are the same between humans and fish. And by being selective about what we compare, uh, we can learn new avenues to study uh, the process of engraftment of, of organoid, kidney organoid tissue. Um, for instance, uh, cadherin 11 was one gene. Here it's in a single cell in an uninjured kidney adjacent to a tube. 
And after injury, there's a lot more of it. And you see it in little clumps, which are the new nephrons invading an old nephron to try and create a patent connection. Um, so we're learning a lot, sort of in the same way, Homer Smith, E.K. Marshall, some of the early pioneers here at MDIBL came and took creatures out of the ocean and studied how they could inform human biology we're taking a zebrafish that grows in our aquaculture system and asking where are the parallels between the processes we see in the fish and the processes that go on normally or under pathological conditions in humans. Uh, and again, take advantage of a fish as a discovery platform to, in this case, uh, push the envelope on our renal regeneration and engraftment. So what are we really learning uh, from these fish that regenerate their kidneys? I, I think what we're seeing is that these existing tubes, once injured or stimulated, will express growth factors, uh, secreted molecules, signaling molecules that can diffuse and stimulate stem cells to aggregate, come together, condense into a little tight ball, uh, start forming a tube and a lumen, and then invade to essentially make a new uh, nephron, a new contributor to filtration and kidney function. And our sort of big goal is to engineer this to uh, happen in humans, and perhaps first in a mouse, where instead of the normal um, existing stem cells we see in a fish, we could introduce uh, pluripotent cells that have been turned into kidney stem cells through IPS and stem cell technology, introduce those into a uh, adult kidney, and then engineer them, engineer the kidneys to express the growth factors that we know the fish expresses that stimulate the stem cells to aggregate and invade and form a new nephron. And so this is the core part of our contribution to the Rebuild a Kidney Consortium. We're doing that with Leif Oxberg, who uh, both he and Denise Marciano were visiting scientists here two years ago. And I can say it was really through that interaction here at MDIBL in this lab uh, that gave us this nucleus of uh, the, the combination of approaches we needed to be competitive to get funding for this. And it was after that that we, we succeeded in getting funding through this Rebuild a Kidney Consortium. So MDIBL, the visiting scientists tradition is a great one for building science in general. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to thank all the people. Uh, Nana, my senior staff scientist here, uh, Nana Kamai has really pioneered this work. Um, Sam Hughes and Heiko Schenk, uh, Amber Wolf, Olivia Aries are all contributing uh, significantly. Heiko has a really interesting project that's just getting off the ground, looking at how tissue damage and inflammatory signals can stimulate the stem cells. Um, so yeah, I mentioned Leif Denise, uh, Jennifer Lewis, Melissa, um, and also we received significant support from the McKenzie Foundation that has uh, really been enabling us to take uh, high risk approaches and learn some really radical new things. So that, that's been a great contribution. And I think that's me and I will stop the share and be happy to take any questions. Ian, thank you so much. What an exciting glimpse into you know, the future, really, what might potentially um, be possible in terms of treating this disease. It's exciting to see this work continuing. Also exciting to think about, you know, this laboratory on, on an island off the coast of Maine playing such an essential role in sort of what we know about um, kidney disease today and, and certainly maybe driving uh, what's to come. So thank you for sharing that overview with us. It's very exciting. So I'm certain there must be some questions out there for Ian and in terms of, you know, understanding the potential implications for this work. So if you'd like to try the raise your hand feature, we would be more than happy to call on you and ask you to unmute. You can find that in the reactions um, section. We have one. Um, Michael, let me go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Ian. Thanks a lot for a great presentation, informative as always. And I'm a huge fan of MDIBL, as you know. Um, I'm just curious if um, you or others uh, have uh, started looking into um, kind of a, a another almost parallel aspect of, um, at least what's seen in some fish, the 
um, the ability to, um, like C. elegans, go into a somewhat dour-like state. So this is work that uh, hasn't been done in the kidney so much, but uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, uh, her, he's in Oregon, I'm forgetting. He works on some South American fish. Um, but they, there are some fish that um, you can basically put them almost into a stasis state. And, I, and the reason I'm asking the question is what you think there might, what kind of a connection you think there might be with this developmental reprogramming and even potentially pausing development at certain set times like we would need to do with um, inducing pluripotent stem cells. And if there might be other models that perhaps should be looked at even more to address those kinds of things. Maybe a little bit too far off topic though. No, it's a really interesting question, Mike. Um, you know, the things that come to mind are, are diapause in certain fish species like the African turquoise killifish. Um, perhaps there's things we could learn about watching them develop, but that happens during uh, embryonic development, uh, not so much in the adult state. But there you could ask, you know, how you might induce such a state just to preserve function. And maybe more importantly, when you come out of diapause, are there regenerative processes that need to happen to make a kidney fully functional? And one of the, uh, I think amazing projects that's been going on on MDI is uh, done by Ron Corstani, hanging out with bear hunters, uh, looking at bears coming out of hibernation. And so that's not a diapause, but it's a um, kind of an arrested state of metabolism. And he finds there are really interesting gene expression profiles as the kidneys start to function again. Um, so there might be, I think your question is probably most relevant to the idea of what we can do to promote endogenous repair of existing nephrons, as opposed to stem cell derived nephrons. In us, our, our repair processes uh, are directed at existing nephrons, the, the tubes that are already there. And if you can improve the um, recovery of, of those, promote productive repair, um, then you can avoid chronic kidney disease. And I think that's a, a major goal right now. Um, probably less complicated than building new kidneys, but still pretty complicated. That's great. So the question in the chat from Dilwar, he says, during evolution, humans have kept maximum characteristics for survival, but lost regeneration of organs. What might be the reason humans have lost this property during evolution? You know, I, I think about that a lot. And I know uh, just about everyone here thinks about that a lot. And I think uh, one, one sort of opinion, I don't have an answer, by the way, but one opinion is that, uh, you know, we see it as a loss or a deficit in humans, uh, when in fact, there's probably a very good reason and a very adaptive reason that humans evolved this way, or mammals evolved this way. Living on dry land, uh, it's possible if we didn't rapidly fibrose or, or, or seal a wound, we could bleed out. Um, so, you know, it's, it's basically one strategy and regenerative creatures have their own strategies. Um, some surprising things I think are coming out that basically the injury signals are really pretty much the same between say an axolotl and a human or a, a fish uh, and a human. Uh, but the response or the, the signals are interpreted differently by different cells. And so, you know, when you, when you compare, you take this comparative approach of why are we different? I've been shocked at how many things are the same. For instance, all of the growth factors that stimulate kidney uh, regeneration in a fish are essentially the exact same ones that work. This Wnt9 b FGF4, 10, they're all the same growth factor families that are expressed in human development. So then what's the difference? So why, how, why can't we do? It's basically this, the switches that we should be studying and the interpretation of the signals. And once we, the real power of this comparative approach will, will be when we define the divergence points and we define how to switch them back over and recover an ability that was 
a sacrifice perhaps for another advantage, but that we could superimpose on our own re regenerative capacity. How's that for an answer? Is that, does that work? Priag, what'd you think? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's perfect. Actually, I have a question for you, Ian. <laughs> if I may ask. So um, I was wondering about the kidney stem cells that you, that, that you brought up in your talk. Um, what is known about them? How do they divide? Do they often divide even in the absence of injury without differentiating? That's the question. Uh, we don't know. That's the answer. Uh, I can tell you how we know about them. Uh, it was very much a bootstrapping process of discovery. Uh, it was quite fortuitous, this LHX GFP line um, labeled them, or at least labeled the new nephrons that were forming. And so sort of classical serial transplant studies were done, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, isolating fluorescent cells, putting them into a naive host kidney and showing that they, were, they contributed to making new nephrons. We followed that by showing that uh, in single cell studies, single cell RNA-seq, there was a cluster um, of stem cells that we could identify based on marker or gene expression profiles that we knew were also expressed in these fluorescent cells that you could transplant. And then that gave us this whole new technology to look at this cluster of cells. Um, and we found that when you compare this cluster to the fetal kidney uh, stem cells, they have about 60 or 80 genes in common. Uh, so right now we're, we're at the process of developing ways to answer the question you, you're asking, uh, better lineage markers for them, understanding how they respond to injury signals like uh, cytokines, uh, sterile inflammation type uh, responses. Um, we have done some EDU incorporation uh, to look at proliferation. And we're surprised to find actually that if, if they do proliferate, I mean, if they have an explosive proliferation during injury, it happens very early because when we added EDU late, we didn't see a lot of EDU positive fluorescent cells, green fluorescent cells. So uh, there's still a lot of questions about the maintenance of these cells and how quiescent they are and whether they, I think what you're driving at is how do you preserve this population over the lifespan of a fish? Absolutely. Do they become depleted uh, in old animals? And that's something we hope to do in the uh, African turquoise killifish that has a very short lifespan. Uh, there we can ask, are the cells gone you know, in, in old animals or do they still regenerate? Uh, so one of the summer students, Olivia Aries has cloned uh, two of those genes that I've been talking about, LHX and 62, uh, from the African turquoise killifish, and she's doing, it, you know, starting to look in vivo at their expression. Fantastic, thank you. So, Ian, we have a question in the chat from Susan, who said, who asks, has progress been made in connecting a blood supply to organoid nephrons? I'd say yes, and I think that has. Um, if you engraft uh, organoid tissue into the capsule of a kidney, you can recruit the host vasculature. Uh, and some argue that they form functional filters. And I think that is probably driven by expression of, of uh, VEGF, for people who know what that is, is vascular endothelial growth factor in the podocytes, which are the, the cells that form the blood filter. So the growth factor expression in the organoid cells is, appears to be sufficient to recruit host tissue in there to form blood vessels. Uh, and you can also impact the development of blood vessels in organoids uh, to some extent by having VEGF expressing cells nearby. Um, so we're looking, just to complete the thought, um, we think that yes, they can form some rudimentary blood vessels but they can't do the other end. And so we're thinking of how we can get the same idea, localized expression of a growth factor to recruit the other end of the tube to form a connection. And that's our, our goal. Very cool. Ian, I have a quick question for you. You mentioned the comparative approach um, in this pr process and within the Rebuild a Kidney Initiative, I know there's a lot of zebrafish work, there's some mouse work. Are there other organisms that you all are, are studying to sort of shed light on this? Uh, the human being, actually. We <laughs> okay, well, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I, honestly, I'd say that the emphasis in general in all regenerative medicine has definitely become human shifted and, and human cell derived. Ultimately, we have to generate organoids with human cells. And even though there are limitations of the organoids, uh, the purity of cell populations, the sort of vary, you know, the variability of the product you get out the other side is, is somewhat troubling. But uh, I think everyone sees the eye, they have their eyes on the prize of engrafting human tissue. So it's very shifted. So actually our group is really the only fish group in Rebuild a Kidney. And it's solely because they do this unique uh, well, apparently unique compared to humans anyway, this engraftment um, story. So that's why we're funded. Hmm. Fascinating. Any other questions for Ian? Go ahead, Chuck. Thank you, Ian. The, the number of threads you're bringing together for this tapestry of understanding is just mind boggling. Uh, one of the things that uh, came back to mind, it's kind of a Oh, there are satellite cells in kidneys too, the muscle uh, correlation. Back in the early 70s, Dick Goss had a student looking at kidney regeneration. He did some rather delicate fetal surgery to perform unilateral nephrectomies. And then in the newborn, subsequently, you had a kidney with an extreme number of new nephrons. So that sounds similar to what you're seeing. Uh, Is that in the mouse? It's in the rat uh, do, doing the, the, the surgery uh, itself was <laughs> fascinating, but, uh, and using a hemostometer to count the number of nephrons in the uh, operated and unoperated uh, neonates. But mm -hmm. uh, I, it just occurred to me that that might be an answer to what was going on, that there was a super stimulation of those cells that would otherwise have become stem cells sitting by the side. Just a thought, uh, your... Yeah, I think the um, people looked, as soon as people figured out the markers like 6-2 that they could use to see stem cells, they looked exhaustively in an adult mammalian tissues and they just didn't you know like five years of disappointment and, they, and then we gave up because they're not there so um it's really interesting though that uh basically stressful conditions or or demand on function might promote continued uh nephrogenesis uh, and i i don't i haven't read that paper i'd be really interested to see i, I do know that in uh for instance sharks and skates uh, there have been some nice work showing that if you injure one side of the kidney, the other side will respond with making new nephrons. Um, and that implies there are, uh, you know, humoral factors or maybe things we could inject that would promote nephrogenesis. In fact, we're finding a pretty basic one, growth factor seems to be, uh, growth hormone seems to be sufficient to produce nephrons in the fish. So something like that would be, you know, a magic bullet if we could figure out what it was in the mammal. It, it was back in the day, and it may not be relevant today. He was looking at the difference between hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Do you get more nephrons or do the nephrons you have simply become elongated and re replace the functional capacity? So I think the, the majority view is that it's hypertrophy in adults now, but I think what you're saying is that it may be the stage where you do the nephrectomy might right. dramatically change yeah. the, the regenerative process. And that's something we, I haven't read about. It'd be interesting to learn about. Now, Paul Tarter was the student, as I recall. I, I, can, I can forward you whatever I can find. Yeah, that would be great. Very cool. So, Michael, I just saw you have a great question in the chat. You want to just ask it yourself? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, as you were talking about the uh, zebrafish reconnecting, uh, so one of the old models of uh, getting renal tissue to grow is to, or other tissues for that matter, is to transplant things under the kidney capsule. I'm just curious if you all have tried to transplant uh, zebrafish cells. Uh, or stem cells underneath a mammalian kidney capsule to see if they'll reconnect uh, into the nephrons that are there in the mammal. 
No, that would be fun. We have not done that. I know Nana has had that on the list of things to try. It would, you know, have to be a nude mouse or a an NSC right. mouse. Um, the temperature difference is an issue, 37 versus 28. Um, but, you know, we may be able to, we, we've been thinking about, can we get uh, mouse cells to engraft in a kidney? If we took mouse embryonic cells out and uh, put them into a fish, I mean. Yeah, that's the other way of doing it, which would be interesting. Really interesting. Um, sort of scaling it back a little bit in terms of practicality. Um, the other experiment I think we should do is take the adult stem cells, we got a bunch of them, and put them into a larval fish and see if they can form new nephrons sort of prematurely or whether we have to engineer the environment of the larval fish to express the right growth factors, et cetera, to stimulate nephron addition. And to me, that's, that sounds actually doable. You know, you, and and the, the beauty of it is it, it gets us back to like a very rapidly developing short time period experiment where you can engineer a, a kidney to express whatever you want really and test the response of uh, implanted fluorescent stem cells. So that's kind of what the direction I've been thinking of going. Interesting. Thanks. In, in the zebrafish, as the zebrafish fish ages, does it lose the ability to generate new nephrons? Excellent question, Jerry. <laughs> Fund me and I'll give you the answer. Okay, I'm working on it. I'm working on that's it. <laughs> is for. That's why it's such a great system to have here. It's because all of these questions about age-related degeneration or regeneration deficits, if they exist, we should be able to see them. And Olivia, who I see is on the call here, is uh, she's making the tools to answer your question. So you can quiz her at the at the uh, poster. All right, the I'm going to. <laughs> that's that's terrific. Well, thank you again. Any other last questions for Ian before we let him get to his evening? Thank you so much, Ian. And if you're interested in learning more about Ian's research, we'd love to um, be able to, to share more details with you. So just reach out and let us know. We'd be happy to arrange a tour uh, of the lab for you while you're here, if those of you that are here um, for the summer. And in the meantime, I wanna just let you know, Ian's going to be joining Dr. Haller next week at our annual meeting and giving a great overview of the different research projects that are currently underway at MDIBL. So if you're interested in learning more about the breadth of research that we have here, I encourage you to tune in. It's at 10 a.m. next Thursday, the 22nd. And information is on our website if you wanna know how to register for that meeting. So it's a great overview and it will give you a chance to kind of catch up on all that's happening here at the lab. Then I want to just quickly announce um, a schedule change. We had a science, our next science cafe was scheduled for July 26, and that was with Dr. Haller. But we just learned that we have an opportunity to have Dr. Nirav Shah, who many of you uh, who have been in Maine during COVID know him as the director of the Maine CDC. So he's gonna join us um, with Dr. Haller and do a joint presentation on August 2nd. We changed the date so that we can accommodate him. Also that's um, the last week in July is College of the Atlantic's big, um, um, Champlain Institute, so we wanted to sort of avoid some conflicts there. So I encourage you all to join us on August 2nd. We'll have an opportunity to ask some questions of Dr. Shah. I think he's really going to talk a bit about some of the lessons learned through this entire COVID um, you know, process and situation about science communication, the importance of science education, all of those things. We're still sort of developing the details of that presentation, but it should be a great opportunity to hear directly from him. So thank you all so much for joining us. We're really excited uh, to be able to continue to bring you these presentations, our science cafes virtually. Um, if you're interested in supporting those, I would encourage you to go to our website. You can learn more about how you can do that there. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful evening. And thank you again, Ian, for sharing your work with us. Thanks. Thank you all for your smart questions and for coming. It's great to see you.